So, um, hi, well, a lot of people. Great. Um, I'm Sebastian, I work for Canva, I was already introduced. Um, just as a, um, to start, there are, the slides and sample code are already on GitHub. You can find them there, and I'm also on Twitter there, if you want to contact me, if you want to ask any questions, but we're also doing questions at the end. Um, so first up, who is actually using some form of functional reactive programming in production? And what kind of libraries are you using? Are you using um, anyone Reactive Coco or RX Swift? Yep, a few of those. Anything else that you're using? All right. Um, so the code, so there, there are quite a few code samples in here, and they're all Reactive Coco, but all the principles apply to any FRP system. Um, it's an advanced talk, so I'm kind of assuming that you know what signals and events are and know about filter and map and maybe a bit of flat map, but that's pretty much it. Um, I'm actually going to cover flat map in detail um, and I want to talk about managing state with scan, um, talk about handling errors which can be a bit tricky um, and I'm not sure if I've got time for the last bit, I might talk about something called unfolding which is pretty cool. Um, right, so why do we use FRP? Uh, why do we use flat map on signals? Well, to get rid of this monstrosity of callback hell, which is indenting further and further, and everything is really terrible, and the, the, your code is far to the right of the screen. You can't read anything. So you use signals, and everything is awesome and you just linearly list all your steps. You can chain asynchronous tasks. Um, and it actually scales well. You can add more tasks and it doesn't look any more complex because you've ju just got a list of steps that you can just follow through. It's quite easy to read once you're used to it. Um, but often we've got existing code that we want to use and that existing code, asynchronous code might be callback based. So how can we actually go from a function that's callback based, so it takes some value and takes a callback and then, well, returns void. How can we use that function and create a signal based function from that? It's actually quite simple and it's, there's a mechanical way of doing that. So there's a generic way. So if you want to use signals, but you've got existing callback based code, you can just use that one function to convert all your callback code into the signal world. Um, so we just first off start with a function that takes our existing callback based function and we want to return another function that takes the value but instead of taking a um, callback block we just return a signal producer. Um, the great thing is once we've got the type signature the implementation is actually really straightforward because let's just try to get this to compile. So the first thing we need to do, we return a function that takes a T. Um, that function needs to return a signal producer. Um, and so th this compiles, it's obviously not working yet. Um, the signal producer is initialized with a start handler. Um, if you haven't created your own custom signals before, this is how you do it. Um, you put, give it a start handler so once you start the producer, it actually um, runs the signal and you get a, an observer in the um, start handler that you can then send events to. So what we need to do is call our existing callback based function f with the value supplied and give it a callback. Um, and so now the, the thing left to do is actually send the, that u value that we got in the callback, we need to send that to the observer and complete the signal. Um, so this function actually just converts between those two functions and now you don't need to write a custom wrapper for each of your um, callback based functions, you can just use this. If your callback returns an error in, in a failed case, then there's a very similar function that also handles that where you might get a callback with a U or an error and they're optional and then you check what's going on and then you might send an error um, on the signal in the error case. So that's great. Um, but, so 
most of your callback um, base code will be will be network code, but there's also a lot of other asynchronous things that we can actually model with signals. Um, for example, UI is actually an asynchronous task. If you present a button to the user, after a while they might tap the button. They can tap the button multiple times. That's why we can actually get just get a signal from a button if we're using whatever framework we're using. Um, but not just an existing button can be modeled as a signal. You can actually model buttons that don't even exist yet as a signal and get the stream of their values before you actually create the button. So when would we need that? Like when do we need the event of a button before we have the button? Um, in our app, we've got on the top left, we've got the a little cog button. When you press that, you get the option to either sign out or go to a help screen. Um, now, the cock button doesn't do anything interesting. It just brings up more UI. I'm not interested in that. I don't care about those events. What I care about is the sign out and the get help. Um, so if we can model the bringing up the alert controller and tapping the button, if we can model that as a signal, then we can just take the signal from the cog and combine that using flat map with the bringing up the UI, and then we just get one signal of the button that we're actually interested in. So let's look at some code. Um, so what we want is a signal producer for that button. Um, it's very similar to the way that we created the other signal producer. Um, I've omitted a few things. The view controller you might want to capture weekly, but just for brevity, let's not do that. Um, so you create an um, alert controller in the signal producer, and then you just present it. So this is a signal producer that, when started, presents some UI. So now we just need to add some buttons. Um, so, let's, so what we need is the sign out button. So we just add a sign out button. And in that block, we can now send events to the observer. All right. So what have we done here? We've got a signal producer, when we start it, an alert controller comes up with one button, we tap the button, it sends an event on the signal, and then it completes. But it's not very useful with just one button. If we only have one button, well, that doesn't really help. So we're also adding a cancel button. So if you press cancel, the signal just completes without ever sending a value, which, as we just find out on the next slide, is actually very useful. Um, so now we have actually, we represented our um, bringing up the UI, tapping a button, it's all nicely in a signal. So the only thing left to do is just flat map that on the cock button. So now we don't need to d deal with the events of the button anymore. We just have one signal, which in that case is the logout signal that fires an event every time the user taps logout. And we don't even get notified about the cock button anymore because we're not interested in that. If you've got multiple buttons, like we have in the, so in, the, in the screenshot, then you can just use an enum to send an identifier for which button you've tapped in the um, alert controller. But, so you can't only, there's more things you can do with flat map other than chaining asynchronous tasks. You can even filter and map in one go with flat map. So in this case, for example, we've got some signal that sends an integer. If it's divisible by two, we square the value and return it wrapped in a signal producer. That's how we map. If it's, if it's not, then we just return an empty signal producer, which is similar to the cancel button before. It just filters the value out. We don't get anything. Um, so we, we've mapped and filtered in, the, in one step. Um, now, with all that, chaining asynchronous work, filtering and flat mapping. We can actually model really complex control flow graphs just with signals. Say we've got a task, we've got a button. On, when you press the button, you start a network request, which can either succeed or it can fail because, well, the user needs to pay first. Um, so if it fails with a payment error, you want to present a UI like the alert controller before with confirm and cancel, if the user confirms, then you start a new request with the, um, 
that handles the payment. Otherwise, you cancel and nothing happens. If you're not using FRP, if you're just using traditional buttons and callback-based code, you need to keep track of state. Um, it actually really gets out of hand. Your code is all over the place. Um, you might start writing several classes to encapsulate the state. But with what we've just seen before, this is actually all you need to do. You've got a button signal, and then on button tab, use flat map to export the document. Um, in the case of an error, you just check if it's a payment error. Otherwise, you just forward the error. Um, if it is a payment error, you show the payment UI, which would be a function very similar to the alert controller um, signal we've seen before. Um, again, on flat map, you process the payment. And then it's kind of like flat map, except that it fires on completion. When that completes, you actually export the document. Um, so now we've got something that really reads very close to our specification rather than having code that's all over the place. We don't need to handle any state um, in here. We just need to observe that and then do the appropriate actions um, for when the, the, task, the whole task is finished or the whole task fails with an error that we haven't recovered from. Um, if you use the um, reactive cocoa um, and flatten up a lot, you've probably seen three flattened strategies, which are often, if your signal is always sent just one value, they're, they're equivalent. So most people tend to just ignore them for now or just use one that they found somewhere. Um, but once your signals can send multiple values, which is important for button taps, for example, because your button sends multiple values. Um, you need to understand the three strategies. So they're merge, concat, and latest. Um, so merge, if you've got a signal that sends, um, so you've got nested signals that you want to flatten, um, with the merge strategy, all of the signals are subscribed to immediately as they come through. Um, and the, all the events are formatted immediately as well, um, which means you don't lose any values. All of the values come through. Um, and it completes when all of the events send, uh, all of the signals send complete. Concat, on the other hand, if new producers are sent on a signal, it queues them up um, until the previous um, producer completes. So you can actually run um, tasks in sequence with Concat. Um, producers are only started once the previous work is finished. Um, and it, in the end, it also concatenates all the values. Um, again, you don't lose any values if you use concat. Um, latest, on the other hand, if a new signal producer comes in, it just ignores the um, it just ignores the previous producer, starts the new producer, and only forwards events from that. So, for example, if you have a button tap that starts a network request, um, then tapping it twice might start the request a second time. With latest, you actually just discard whatever was done at the first time. And if you're handling disposal well, then you actually can cancel your network request as well. And obviously, in that case, you do some values do get dropped if a new signal com comes in or the previous ones are dropped. Um, all right, so that's flat map. It's really, really useful. You can do so many things with it. Um, I encourage you to look at it in detail and maybe play around with it a bit. Um, with the slides, there's also some sample code, which is really messy right now, but I'll clean it up later, hopefully. Um, right, so often we need to keep track of state in our apps. And flat map, because we can chain things nicely, it often helps us to avoid state. But there is some state that we sometimes just need in our app, because otherwise, well, it's not really doing much. Um, if we have a button and we say we just want to count how many times the button is tapped as a very contrived example. Um, in a traditional approach, you've got code in three different places. You have a button that you initialize or add a target and action. You've got a counter variable. And you've got a method um, for the button target. In that method, you mutate your counter variable. I think that's pretty terrible because, well, you can't look at it at one go and see what's going on. You can't isolate the state. Everything, even if you make it private, everything in your class can mutate that counter. Um, so you think, well, I might use a signal on the button and just do this. Unfortunately, this is really dangerous. 
don't mutate anything in a map. Um, if you do this, then, and just have one observer that just prints the, the counter that's returned from that signal, it all seems to work fine, but as soon as you get a second observer on that signal, it actually changes the way the values are produced. So you actually get different streams of values. If you've got two producers, you tap the button once, the first uh, two observers, the first observer gets a one, the second observer gets a two. So don't do that. Um, because, as I said, observation changes the signal, and you don't want that. Um, let's take a step back and think about how we, for example, sum an array of integers, which in objective C we would have probably done with a for loop that has some state that we mutate, which is our sum that we keep track of. Um, in Swift, we can just do this. We've got the reduce function that I think all of you have stumbled upon. Um, we just give it a starting value of zero, a function that combines the accumulator and the current value, which in this case is just plus. It adds up all the values by doing 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 6. Um, that's kind of similar what we want, but we also want all the intermediate values in our signal. So there's a similar function, which is scan. doesn't exist in the Swiss standard library. You find it in many other languages. It's got a very, you can actually implement it with um, reduce. It's got a very similar implementation. Um, and this actually does the same work, but it keeps all the intermediate values and puts them in an array. Um, both reduce and scan um, are implemented on signals in reactive cocoa, probably in all other libraries as well. Um, reduce is less useful. You'd probably more often use scan. Um, you've seen this. This is the um, Swift. This Swift's. Um, type signature for reduce. Scan looks exactly the same, except that it returns an array. And on signal producer, it actually also looks pretty much exactly the same. It takes the same arguments, an initial value, and a combined function, but now it returns a signal producer. So with scan, you can actually keep state between events, um, accumulate state that is not mutable, mutable outside the signal. Um, so how does our button tap look like with scan? Um, so say on the button, we just get events of whatever value that we're not interested in. So just use scan with an initial value of 0. Um, we get a running total. And every time scan is called, we just add 1 to the running total. And because we're not muta mutating any state, if we've got multiple observers here, they are getting all the same value, you will get the correct value in all the observers. You press the button once, all the observers get one. You press this again, they all get two. Um, now, what can we do if we actually want a minus button as well? So you've got a counter that you can increase and decrease. Um, in our previous, in our OO approach, we'd need to add a new target action or use the same target action and then switch on the type of the sender and do some really horrible stuff. Um, but if we make a small change to our existing implementation, now we just map one to every, we map every event on the plus button to one, then we can just use the plus function in our scan because it adds one and then one and then one every time you tap. So we have the plus button signal that always sends one. We just merge that with a minus button signal that we map to minus one. This is your counter. That's all the code you need. It doesn't leak out. You just, just have an observer. That observer can update your UI. And it's all in one place. And once you're used to reading that, it's actually really easy to read because you don't have to jump around in your code files. We're actually using scan quite a lot. Um, we're using it for analytics to count types of interactions. Um, instead of getting many analytics events, we just accumulate events with scan. Um, we're also using this thing, which, um, depending on a rendering mode signal that can change, we switch between live rendering and snapshot rendering um, in the app. This is all it, it needs. There is no mutable state on that class. Well, not for that thing. Right. Um, so
So the third thing I wanted to talk about is handling errors. Error handling can be a bit tricky at times. Um, and this is very different if you use Rx Swift because Reactive Cocoa has typed error. So every signal has a value and an error type, whereas I believe Rx Swift does not. Um, you have to th really think about the way that you c your signals can fail in Reactive Cocoa. And if a signal fails in any chain of signals, then the whole chain fails and can never send any more values. So if you're using flat map and the inner producer fails, then if the outer producer sends any more values, there are no values coming through because the whole chain has failed. Whereas if you have a signal in your chain complete, for example, in a flat map, then your producer can still send more values if the outer producer hasn't completed. But failure always spreads through the whole chain. Um, which is really annoying if you've got something like this. You've got a name and a password field. You combine them together, sample it on a button, and flat map to log in. So it logs you in, you press the button, and you've got all your, you pull all your state together. It's great. But because your login function can fail with a login error, if the user um, enters the wrong credentials, press the button, even though the button sends more values, that chain of signals never sends any more values. So you have to remove the, uh, the error. Um, so how do we do that? Um, one thing that I've actually used previously in the slides is flat map error, which is if you get an error and you can start a new task to recover from that. For example, you get the payment error and you want to, um, you want to present some UI because you can gracefully recover from that. Then you can use flat map error. Um, works the same way as flat map, but instead of changing the type of the value, it changes the type of the error. If you can't recover from that by starting a new task, you really want that error to propagate without breaking the whole signal chain. You can use materialize. And what materialize does is it takes all the events and moves them into the value. So if your signal completes, you get an event of completed, and your signal completes. If you get a failed event, your signal sends a failed event as the value, but your signal doesn't fail, it instead just completes. So um, with that, we can just change this to this. And now we get error sent on the value of the signal rather than as a failed event on the signal itself, which means if the login fails, the user can tap the button again, type in the right credentials, tap in the button again, and the login will be performed again. So basically, it gets you from a signal of user and login error to a signal of event of user and login error, and the signal never errors. Um, in some cases, um, you might have a signal that you say, if it fails, I just want to have it run again, maybe attempted three times, because sometimes the network connection might be not great, and you don't want to present the error to the user yet. You just want to perform the work again. There's actually a very simple um, method for that, which is retry. And you give it a count how many times you want the retry to happen. So it swallows up to n errors um, and restarts the signal. But after the nth error, the signal still fails. And if you want to handle any of the errors, then you'd have to do that before the retry, because they never make it past the retry in the signal chain. Um, this is probably rarely what you want to use. Use materialize or flat map error instead. Is that my five minute warning address? All right. Um, I've had some more stuff that's really interesting, but I've heard this beer somewhere. So thanks for your attention. <laughs> and any questions? Yes. So the, the, the question is, what happens if Apple's API is updated and, the, and Reactive Cocoa hasn't caught up with it yet? Um, for the most part, they're independent. 
So if you don't use any private APIs or use assumptions that you make, for example, about um, KV, so KVO, you can use KVO really nicely from within Reactive Cocoa, but a lot of things are not KVO compliant officially, even though they are. You'd use that on your own risk, but if you'd use normal KVO on that, the same thing would happen. So there are no issues. The issue is if you want to update to Swift 3 and Reactive Cocoa 5 is still Swift 2.2. Well, but that happens with any Swift framework. So there's no, like the risk is not bigger just because it's FOP. Yes. Um, the, the question is, is it um, easier to adopt Reactive Cocoa or, or FRP in an existing or a new project? Um, I guess it depends. Um, it's generally, it takes a long time to really understand it, um, although there are some things that immediately give you a benefit. For example, if you just use the, the signals on UI button to have a block-based button approach. I think that already really improves your code. Um, whether you use that on a new project or on an existing project, I don't think it matters. Um, I would recommend starting with small things like that, um, being careful not to do the thing with map and immutable state that I've shown before. This is a bit of a, at first you might want to take some shortcuts. Some of those shortcuts are really dangerous, so you might want to be careful with just Use it very isolated, maybe just in one view controller. See how you feel about it. Read about it. Um, talk to people about it. Um, it takes a long time to really understand, but once you are comfortable with it, it actually, you can write really good code. Um, relating with that, um, is it easy for, uh, say that you are in your project using React to Cocoa, and then you um, hire a developer which is working in using it? Uh, is it easy to like, communicate and to kind of teach? Um, the question is, is it easy to teach and onboard new developers? Um, you should ask these guys back there. Um, is it, Elijah? So I wouldn't want to use it, um, say you're working for an agency, you make an app, it's a three months project, then you hand it off, and then in the future some other guy, some other poor guy has to read your code. It's always terrible to read someone else's code, but if you're not used to FRP and you have to read someone's FRP code, you, well, you can just throw it away because you might just not understand it. But if you, as Elijah said, if you've got someone on the team who can walk you through and who can, who can help with it, then, um, it's still hard, but you know, reading a new code base is always hard. So yes, so many questions. With reactive code, can you still easily to do animations and interactions? Um, yes and no. Um, I've, I've experimented with um, representing animations as signals, um, which is a bit weird, but if it works, it lets you do really good stuff that I, if I had an hour, I would have talked about that as well. Um, so you can, you can use animations, but um, some things, because some of the like interactive transitions, for example, um, the, the way that, the, that Apple's API is built is very much around delegation and mutable state. Sometimes it's just easier to let go and do that part in whatever way Apple wants you to do it. Yes, in the back. Um, so the question is, are there any considerations about testing that code? Yes, it's really easy because um, if you depend on a signal in your code, 
So obviously, if you want to test your code, you use dependency injection. Um, if you now depend on a signal, then you can actually replace that signal with something that's not asynchronous. So you can pull the asynchronous part of your code very far out, test that separately, and then the thing that depends on your asynchronous code, you can actually run with a signal that sends events synchronously. And for all intents and purposes, that should not matter for the, calling co for the, for the code that depends on that signal. So it's actually, it gets quite easy to, to write tests for that, yeah, especially asynchronous code. That's traditionally really hard to test because you can replace it with synchronous signals. Yes, on the left. Um, are crash reports more annoying? Yes. Um, <laughs> if you set a break, so what I, I think it's, um, it's quite easy to understand the intent of code once you're comfortable reading it, because it's all in one place. You can just read it top to bottom. Um, if you set a breakpoint in any of your um, code that's using FRP, um, especially with a lot of long chains of map and flat map, and then you go between Swift and Objective-C, and then there's a lot of conversion, you get to like stack frame 500 something and it's useless. So debugging is very hard. Yes, <laughs> Andrew. Um, in your example, you created an alert view um, and then you also said to avoid side effects. Um, what happens if you observe that more Um. You should probably handle that error gracefully. So I, I said, um, the question is, I had side effects in the thing where I present the, um, where I present the um, alert controller. Um, so one of the principles that I try to use is to have side effects at the start of the chain, which you also do when you have a network request, which is a side effect. And it's a different side effect than presenting UI, but it's a side effect. Um, so you have a side effect at the start. You've got all your... Um, your pure operators in between that don't have any side effects, don't mutate any state, don't depend on mutable state. And then you've got a, your, your observe block where you actually, where you then handle that and you can perform side effects again. Um, in that case, um, you might want to guard against that side effect failing when you start it again and then immediately you send an error on the signal. Um, I should look into that a bit more, seeing that it's in our code base. Thank <laughs> you.